the emotional abuse had finally gotten so bad that I tried to commit suicide. There's, if I took a show of hands, there's many people in this room at some point that thought of suicide. Why? Because the pain was so bad. Welcome to Pacific Garden Mission. For nearly 141 years, Pacific Garden Mission has been in the heart of downtown Chicago, ministering to the needy. But sometimes when we think of the homeless, we forget about the most vulnerable in our society, the women and the children. Some of the women that come here, it's not just because of drugs or alcohol, it could be a domestic situation, an employment situation, but they have nowhere to turn and nowhere to go. The Pacific Art of Mission has continued to be a beacon of light to those that are out there in need of help. So stay tuned, open up your heart to the message, listen to the testimonies, and I want to invite you inside Pacific Art of Mission so you can see what God is doing. Come inside and see. Thank you, Pastor Phil, and welcome inside Pacific Garden Mission. This is one of the rooms where it all gets started. Uh, the women will walk through the doors right behind the cameraman, and they'll come in here and have a seat and wait for counseling, just the same as in the men's day room. People come here in all different methods of transportation. They're dropped off by Catholic charities. They might come from a hospital. Uh, they might leave an abandoned building. They know there's something happening here. They've heard it from somebody, and Jesus Christ is calling people in here so he can minister to them. Today we have two exciting testimonies of lives that were changed here at Pacific Garden Mission, followed by a sermon that's preached by our president, Pastor Phil. The gospel message is what changes people right here in this day room, and the women in this day room will have an opportunity to talk to a staff member and learn what the programs have to offer. They'll learn that in these programs, after they've received Jesus Christ as their Savior, they'll grow spiritually, they'll find God's will in their life, and they'll learn what Christian character is. And as the Word of God pours over them for a year, their life will begin to change because their mind will be transformed and come into agreement with the new spirit in them. So we're really excited that you're joining us today because you're gonna see like a glimpse of what has happened in two women's lives who wanna share their testimonies and Kathy is first. I come from a very affluent suburb. What goes on behind closed doors, most people don't know. Uh, I was a victim of emotional and domestic abuse. I suffered a number of concussions, one of which has affected my eyes to where I have fragments I deal with every day. Um, the verbal abuse was just as bad as the physical, probably harder to get over. I stayed because I have three children. and. I wanted to raise them and I knew I couldn't raise them on my own. My children were never abused at all, not physically, not emotionally, um, and all I ever wanted to do was be a mom. That was my thing. And I was a very good mother. I tried different things to get away from the abuse. I tried um, drinking. Um, that didn't work. I drank three or four months, quit for three or four, things would get bad, I'd drink a little more after that. Um, I tried, because I worked for a psychiatrist, I tried being depressed, and he knew me rather well. And he had said to me, Kathy, when are you going to get out of this? When are you going to quit the insanity? And so I listened a little bit, and he was a Christian doctor, so he talked about Christ every now and then. And I'd sometimes listen, but I'd blow it off. And the abuse, the emotional abuse had finally gotten so bad that I tried to commit suicide. And that obviously didn't work. But the last time I tried it was pretty bad. I tried to slash my wrists, uh, woke up from that. So I took um, 69, I think, extra strength Tylenol, ended up in the emergency room. I was in ICU for 14 days. The um, doctor there had said once they fix my wrists and that, 
um, she had said to me, Kathy, um, your liver is, um, you're on liver failure. And she said, there's some medicine that we can give you. Uh, it might work and it might not. Now, we were sitting talking just, just like normal people talk, and I had assumed that if I were going to die, I would know it. I would be real sick or, or something. And she and I were talking, and she said, you can talk to me one minute and be gone the next. And they gave me the medication, and on the eighth day, it finally started to take effect. So the Lord had saved my life not only once, twice, but three times. The doctor, um, Alex, came in, and he said, Kathy, enough is enough. And I went home and packed a bag, and he brought me to PGM. PGM saved my life. Um, this is where I got saved. I entered the Bible program. Uh, the Bible program taught me obedience, which I really needed to learn because I was rebellious throughout the, the marriage. Um, also taught me forgiveness. I have forgiven my ex-husband. Um, haven't forgotten, but I have forgiven him, mostly for myself, and because the Bible has said that. Um, a wise pastor here, uh, Pastor McNeil, after I had been on the Bible program for about three months, and he had told me, Kathy, if you want to succeed here, you have to work very hard on the program, studying the Bible, as well as in the ministry. And I listened to him. Uh, I took heed to everything he had to say. The Bible program has taught me a lot. Um, my walk with, with the Lord is um, everything that I've ever dreamed of. I've never had a relationship with anybody like I have with him. I graduated in May. Um, I gave my testimony then. Um, and I didn't think I would get to the point of graduation. Um, I tried to leave once or twice, and Pastor, I talked to Pastor McNeil, and he'd say, go up and study your Bible and read some more, and I did. And I realized those times when I kind of wanted to leave, it was because I didn't like myself very much. Also, I wasn't spending enough time with the Lord, and I am learning that the more time I spend with him, the better off I am. Christ is my best friend. Um, I wouldn't be anywhere without him. He gives me the strength I need. Um, he's always there. He's beside me. He's somebody I talk to constantly. Uh, I pray and he answers my prayers. Like I say, he saved my life and now I know when I tried to commit suicide why I didn't succeed because I wasn't saved because I didn't have him in my life, because I wasn't walking with him. Um, and now I have him as, as my best friend. He's my father. I turn to him for everything like I would my father. And he gets me through my days with happiness and with joy and with peace and a lot of comfort. No two testimonies are the same, and Kathy has worked her way through some significant problems, but Jesus Christ is the solution to every complex problem we face here. When known as next, and she was going through uh, pre-medical school when she ran out of money and could no longer stay in her apartment, came to Pacific Garden Mission, joined the Women's New Life program, and God began to do amazing things with her so she could re-enter school and go for her degree. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. I'm Winona, and how I got to the Pacific Garden Mission is I was a student at Chicago State University here in Chicago, and I was living on campus, and I, the semester was coming to a close, and I wanted to reapply to live on campus again to continue my degree program and I was informed that I didn't have any more student loans available to do that. And because all my income was based off of student loans, for me it meant I didn't have anywhere to go. Um, I'm not from Chicago. Um, I had listened to Unshackled, I had listened to the broadcast, but I never physically knew where the mission was. So when the day came that I had to vacate and leave the premises, I had a car that I had purchased at that point with my student loans, so I went to the police station 
and they told me to just sit and wait. They said a van's coming to pick you up. So I waited eight hours, and when the van finally did come, I followed them here to the mission. And when I got here, I didn't expect to be here for a long time. I was hoping to some kind of way finish school and just get a job. I was never um, intended to have a long-term stay at a mission. And the weird thing is, is that the mission was not my first time being homeless. I've actually, my whole entire life has been laced with homelessness. As children, even though my mother did raise us in church, um, my mother always kept an abusive husband or an abusive boyfriend. So we was always in shelters for battered women, or either we was living with church people to escape the abuse of her either boyfriends or one of her husbands. I wasn't unaccustomed to being in a weird environment, but it was just like, oh no, not this again. <laughs> So um, I got here at the mission and I was told from the school that you can't come back until you pay these fees. And because I had been in school since 06 and it was like 12, I had a lot of fees and I couldn't pay them back. So I just started um, living at the mission, called the school to ask them a question. And the financial advisor told me that I had um, scholarship money. And I was like, what are you talking about? And he said, well, you got scholarship money and you can come back. So come to find out, I was able to come back on scholarships and finish. That's how I finished my degree. And I was living here at the mission when I finished. And um, while I was here, I was like six days to a year as an overnight guest. And I decided to go upstairs and get in the Bible program. Um, while I was in the Bible program, I got an emergency phone call from my sister that my mother was finna take her second stem cell transplant. And they needed somebody to come home to have her give her 24-hour care. Um, my two sisters that are already there were caring for her, but they had jobs when I got six kids, so they couldn't do 24-hour hands-on care for her. So I left the program um, the first time I was here. I left in October, and I came back in January of 14 to be her caregiver. My mother lived, I want to say maybe a good year almost after that. Uh, we lost her December 24th of 14. That was six days after I was a college graduate was when I lost my mother. Um, after that happened, I decided to get back into the program and my goal this time was to go straight through and finish. So I'll be doing that next Thursday on January 28th. I'll be finishing the one-year program at the mission. And that was the goal that I had to finish. Um, the first time through, my attitude was that I didn't think it was as important as my college degree was because I was like, it's not even an accredited program. I was looking at it from a natural standpoint, but I think now that that was offensive to God because to God it is important because it's taken a year out of your life to focus on him and to discover what he wants and what his plan is and what his ideal is for my life. And so um, the lesson I have learned is to to honor God no matter what the circumstances. And education is good, you, you should have one, but um, God is even more important than having an education. Where I'm, I'm from, Kansas City, and my pastor always used to tell us, I didn't know what it meant then, but he always used to tell us that education without salvation is an abomination. I was like, what is he talking about, education without salvation? But now I understand what he, what he meant. Um, education is good, but without salvation to guide you and to apply God's wisdom to your wisdom, it really is an abomination because you can have all that and without God it doesn't really, it has more value when God is, stamps his approval up on it. And the people you can help is even more, it's even better because it's not just giving them something natural, but it's helping people live for God. And when you stand before him, nothing else is going to matter but what you did for him. For me, finishing this is my way of honoring God and giving myself an opportunity to deal with my mother's death. Um, I wanted to kind of process that. Um, right now I'm in a, a process where I've, I am a college graduate. I'm in the process of waiting to see if I get into med school. And um, the goal for me this time is to acknowledge God and to really acknowledge him in all my ways so that he will direct my path. And I'm not just going in my own strength on what I know and what I think, but allowing God to truly guide me on what he wants me to do. And uh, my prayer is that I'll be able to say, like Paul said, I have finished my course, but I want to finish the course God has for me. Whatever it is on this earth he wants me to do, uh, my goal is to, fin to finish that 
and to be able to say, God, I did what you told me to do. And so if I can die with that testimony, that, that'd be enough for me. <laughs> Weren't those exciting testimonies of Kathy and Winona and what Jesus Christ is doing in their lives right here at Pacific Garden Mission? You know, there's hundreds of people right now in this building that Jesus Christ is ministering to. And if you're one of those people that needs help, please call the number on your screen or walk by and walk through our doors here at Canal Street in Chicago and we'll be happy to help with you, pray with you. You can join one of our programs. We're here to help you. If you've been encouraged or even challenged by the testimonies you've just watched, stay with us because you're gonna see amazing, amazing things are gonna happen soon right here on this program as Pastor Phil brings forth a message. He'll be preaching in this very auditorium. I'm standing in it, it's empty, the lights are off, but soon it'll be a beehive of activity. It'll fill up with men and women who have no idea the power of the gospel. There's scripture to back that up. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation, first the Jews and then the Greeks. And this is what will happen here. Men from all different backgrounds and women too will come in this auditorium and they will hear the gospel message preached and that's where the change begins as it did in my life and my cameraman's life that you can't see right now. We're excited because no one is in too bad of a shape for Jesus Christ to change their lives and it happens here all the time at Pacific Garden Mission. And we thank you for calling in and writing us that you were affected and saved even by watching this television program. And some people have come from out of state to come and join our New Life or New Day programs right here at Pacific Garden Mission. Jesus is the answer to all the problems, as complex as they might seem. He can help you at home or he can help you here. And we're so grateful that's happening every day. Why don't you come and see what God is doing here? You can come on a Saturday, come for the tour, see this large building, the facility, but more importantly, see what's happening inside of it. You can come and listen to a live radio drama called Unshackled, then you can have dinner with us, and then you'll be in this very auditorium watching our president, Pastor Phil, preach a gospel message, which is gonna be very, very helpful to all of us, those we sit in and listen and you watch at home. And then you can also come and volunteer. We love to have people come and volunteer and give some of their acts of love. You can meet other people here and find out what you have in common. You can also talk to some of the men and women in the New Life and New Day programs. And this volunteer experience, whether you're making beds or serving meals in the canteen or the cafeteria, or whether you're walking the hallways and meeting those in the programs, you will really be blessed and you'll be participating in the kingdom of God and seeing what God is doing here. And finally, did you know we take no government or state funding? Everything done here is through the kind hearts of those that love what's happening right here at Pacific Garden Mission. They see the sign out front that says Jesus saves and that's all we do. Our sole purpose is to reach the lost with the gospel and then help our guests become fully functioning followers of Christ. You can do that too right now. You can be part of this ministry. You can partner with God if you'll just take a moment and go to our secure website. You can give a one-time gift or a monthly recurring gift. And as you do that, we'll send you a newsletter with testimonies like Kathy's and Winona's in it, who you just watched earlier. And you'll see the goodness of God and what he's doing here. You'll be part of the nutritive soil here at Pacific Garden Mission that is helping all of the people that walk through these doors, like myself, let God take them to their full and highest potential. And I know that you'll be blessed and just uh, really enjoy it as you do. Luke chapter 11, we deal with a familiar theme here in the ministry of Jesus Christ, the reality of the spiritual world. And as you read the Word of God, and I want you to hear this tonight, there is a spiritual world. There is much more than what we see. You see, when I think of the spiritual world, a few things come to mind. It is a place of conflict. We see, biblically speaking, I think of a story in the book of Daniel where Daniel was praying and the Bible says it took a number of days for him to get his prayer answered. And the reason is because the angel came, right? Do you remember the story? And he was delayed a number of days because there was a battle in the heavenlies. Uh, the book of Revelation talks about a final battle in the heavenlies. It is a place of conflict. But it's also an amazing place of influence. I think of Acts chapter 5 and verse 3 when Peter was speaking to Ananias. He said, Why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Here Ananias was and Sapphira his wife. 
And Peter says what happened, he said, Satan filled your heart. Yes, it played out in the physical realm, but Satan filled their heart to do what they did. I think of Luke 22, 3, where the Bible says, Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. We know that Judas betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ, but the Bible tells us it was Satan who entered into him. First Chronicles chapter 21, verse 1, then Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. So Satan has influence in our minds. Think about that. We, we see the case of Ananias and Sapphira. They could have thought that he hatched the plots to lie about the land. But Peter says that Satan filled your heart. We think of David, and David came up with the idea of numbering the people, but the Bible says it was Satan stood up against Israel. We think about Judas, go ahead and betraying the Lord Jesus Christ, but the Bible says Satan entered into Judas. The point is, my friend, there is a spiritual world that's very real, that is a place of conflict, that has influence, and for many of us, it has impacts in our lives. Jesus said, the thief cometh not but for to kill, steal, and destroy. And that is his goal. I was reading this article, listen to this. This is out of CNN, and that's not a, an authority in spiritual truth. But listen to this article. This, uh, this doctor, this psychiatrist, was writing about what he saw. He said, you've probably seen this before. A soul corrupted by Satan, a priest waving a crucifix at a snarling woman. Movies and books have mimicked exorcism so often that they become cliches. But this was an actual exorcism and included a character not normally seen in the traditional drive-out-the-devil script. Dr. Richard Gallagher is an Ivy League-educated, board-certified psychiatrist who teaches at Columbia University and New York Medical College. He was part of a team that tried to help the woman. F fighting Satan's minions wasn't a part of Gallagher's career plans, while he was studying medicine at Yale. He knew about biblical accounts of demonic possession, but thought they were an ancient culture attempt to grapple with medical disorders like epilepsy. He proudly calls himself a man of science. Yet today, Gallagher has become something else, the go-to guy for, sprawling, for a sprawling network of exorcists in the U.S. He says demonic possession is real. He's seen the evidence. Victims suddenly speaking perfect Latin, sacred objects flying off the shelves, people displaying hidden knowledge or secrets about people that they could have not known possibly or never would have known. There was one woman who was like 90 pounds soaking wet. She threw a, a, a deacon who was about 200 pounds across the room. He says, that's not psychiatry. That's beyond psychiatry. Again, here is a secular source a man who says, I didn't believe this stuff, but I want to tell you, there is a spiritual world. You see, what the evil one wants many of us to do is deny that he really exists. There is no Satan. There is no devil. There is no evil. And if there is, he does not have influence on my life. And if that's the case, he has won the battle. Well, well Jesus here in Luke chapter 11 and verse 14 we saw the story in the previous week speaking about prayer, but I find it interesting, once after talking about prayer, now we have a demonic episode, verse 14. We're going to see an example, the attack, and a parable that Jesus gives. Now look at the example. And as he was casting out a devil, it was dumb. And it came to pass, when the devil was gone out, the dumb spake, and the people what? Wondered. Wondered. Now, here's a person, and again, not all sickness is a result of demonic possession. Again, we see many times, I think of just the Gospel of John. There was in John chapter 9, the man was born blind. And they asked, who sinned? Did this man sin or his father sin? It wasn't about demonic, uh, demonic possession. It was so the glory of God can be revealed. I think of John chapter 5, a man had an infirmity who laid by the pool for 38 years. It wasn't de demonic possession, so not everybody that limps or has a problem is demon-filled. But the point is, there is a segment 
where Satan does bind people. And in this case, this man here was bound. He was dumb. He couldn't speak. And just think how people could have diagnosed him and spoken about what was wrong with him or what was happening. But Jesus, knowing the reality comes, comes down there and he casts out the devil. And can you imagine this man when he begun to speak? Hello there. Whoa! What? He's talking. I don't know what he said, but man, it must have been amazing. But look at the attack in verse 15. But some of them said he casteth out devils through Beelzebub, the chief of the devils. Do you know, listen to this. When people cannot have a reasonable argument about an issue, they resort to slander. Did you ever notice that? Sometimes you're trying to talk to somebody and you're having a dialogue and a discussion and they don't know how to answer you and, well, you're an idiot. You're brainwashed. You're this and you're that. Oh, okay, and now we start slinging names and cliches. That's what happened here. They couldn't argue against what happened. Here was an individual that was dumb who couldn't speak. Jesus comes down and the man suddenly is talking. Something occurred. So instead of saying, Jesus, you're different and maybe we need to listen to you, well, it must be because of the devil. That's what it is. Sometimes people can't explain what has happened to some of you, where you used to be years ago. Satan had you bound, and all of a sudden God has changed your life. Jesus Christ has moved in and taken up residence. Well, you're, you're brainwashed. Man, when I was getting high, you weren't saying that. You know, and when I was on that Jenny Crack diet and lost all that weight, you weren't calling me names. Now all of a sudden, all these, this stuff comes out. You're a Bible thumper, Jesus freak. You believe that stuff. You know, all the, the God squad, all these names and people want to come up with and stuff. Instead of talking about the reality, something happened to you. Somebody that was bound by the chains of iniquity and it was, it was living all of a sudden as a, as a servant of the devil now has been set free. Praise God for that. Well, they, they began to, of course, they attack Jesus and call him names. You know, don't worry about when somebody calls you names. When somebody calls you names, think right there, I've won the argument. Amen. Amen. Verse 15. Some of them said he casteth out devils through Beelzebub, the chief of the devils. And others tempting him sought of him to see a what? Did, did not you just see one? We, we want to see a sign from heaven. Look at this. But he knowing their thoughts, Jesus knew what they were thinking. He said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought into desolation, and a house divided against itself falleth. He basically saying Satan cannot be divided. If Satan is casting out Satan, how can Satan advance his kingdom? It, you, your argument really is, is not logical. But many times, anger isn't logical. They just want to spew hatred. That's what they want to do. You're not making sense. If Satan also is divided against himself, how shall a kingdom stand? Because you say that I cast out devils through Beelzebub. So in verse 19, here's the second argument. And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore shall they be your judges. There is also exorcists in that day. And if they were casting out devils, and you're saying that I am casting out devils by the devil, who are they casting them out by? But if I, with the finger of God, cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God is come upon you. And that's the reality there. If this is what I'm doing by God, you, he, you have to deal with the cold, hard reality that the kingdom of God has come upon you. Now look at the story he tells over here, and I, I love this so quickly. We see the uh, attack over there. He says here, When a strong man armed keepeth his place, his goods are in peace. Now again, I really believe this is, remember, this is in response to their accusations, really based on the story that just happened. So again, we see here we're introduced to a strong man. 
The strong man in verse 21 is armed and he keepeth his palace. So notice the strong man is armed. There's, there's something that he has. There's armor. And there's a possession that is his own. It's his palace over there. His goods are what? Goods are in peace. Everything is fine. And I find that interesting that our enemy is armed. Now, I want you to think about this. Satan is the strong man in this story here. Okay, you see, the Bible says when you are born again, you are bought with a price, right? But before Jesus Christ buys us, we are somebody else's possession. And there it is, the, the strong man, and it says that he is, he is armed. Well, well, well what, what is he armed with? Now, I want you to remember this. Biblically speaking, many times we see that the enemy has to inhabit some type of body. In the garden, the serpent came, or it was Satan came in a serpent, right? Do you remember when Jesus cast out the, the devils or the man-man of Gadara? They jumped in the what? Pigs, swine, and they, 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 they ran off a cliff, right? So it seems it has to be in some type of person or some type of body, and he also has strongholds. 2 Corinthians 10.4, let me read this to you. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of what? Strongholds. So there's some people that are, have strongholds that the enemy has gotten a part of their life. And it's for their ultimate, because the thief cometh not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. The goal is your destruction. Now the enemy has his palace, the strong man, and he's a strong man, and he has his palace, and he's armed. Well, what's he armed with? Well, you know, I, I think of 2 Corinthians 2.11. You could write some of those scriptures down. He is armed, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his what? His devices. So, so the enemy has devices. The Bible talks about the fiery darts of the wicked one, right? And when you read the scriptures, you see this spiritual warfare played out. There's a battle going on. And my friend, and for many of us, he has taken up residence. It's not that we're demon-possessed and we're thrashing about, but he has a foothold or a stronghold in our life. And the strong man wants to hold that stronghold for our ultimate destruction. Destroy our life. Destroy our family. Destroy our peace. Destroy our future. Destroy our hope. And ultimately take us to hell and see us burn forever. He wants our destruction. And he also has devices. You know, one of my uh, favorite scriptures on this, I think of Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 26. And I want to quote this to you, Ephesians 4, 26. The Bible says, be angry and what? Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. But look at verse 27. Neither give what? Place. So that means I'm not ignorant of his devices. That means I can give what? Place a foothold or a stronghold. And here it's through our emotions. It says be angry and what? You better get a handle on your emotions here. And I believe many times some of his, his devices are bitterness. Some of us tonight, that's a stronghold that the enemy has for our ultimate. We are bitter at life. Unforgiveness. And that's one of his devices. We won't forgive people that have wronged us. We won't forgive people that have hurt us. We look at our past and our family and we are bitter and the only one being destroyed is us. So we just sit here tonight mad at the world. You're not mad at the person sitting next to you. You're not mad at the person on the dorm. You're not mad at the sun. You're just mad. The enemy has a foothold, a stronghold. And the strong man, there he is, he's taken up residence in the palace and he used these devices. And since we have learned tonight that he can work through our mind like he did with David and numbering Israel, like he did with Ananiah and lying about the money, and he can all of a sudden work through some of our minds. How dare they treat you like that? Yeah. 
How dare they talk to you like that? That inheritance was yours. Your brother's no good. Can't stand that guy. Look what your dad did. Look what your family member did. Look at that plea. Yeah, and we get bitterness, condemnation. The Bible talks in, in Revelation chapter 12 about Satan who stands before the throne of God and accusing day and night. And for some of us, we, we just live under a constant theme of condemnation. We can never go forward because we're always reminded about our past and we're stuck in neutral. Anytime we want to go forward, man, you know, you're no good. God will never forgive you. God will never use someone like you. Been locked up, a felon. Psst, please. You think God's going to use you? Man, you're getting, no. And all of a sudden, there we are under the accusatory tone of the evil one, and the strong man has us. We're bound, and those are his devices. We see this, don't give place because some of us have given place to the enemy. It's a stronghold that he worked from and it corrupts our whole life. We're angry at everybody. We're not going to go forward. We're stuck. We just sit here mad, stewing, angry, always talking about the past, how somebody did us wrong, how my family wasn't right, what my auntie did and what my uncle did, what my father did, what my brother did. And it's all we talk about and, and Satan has us. We never go forward. We never focus on the cross. That is the strong man. Again, verse 21, when a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. Everything is okay, but look at this, the next one. But when a stronger than he come upon him. So we see in the text here, we see a strong man and a what? And I think in the case, in the context, talking about this man that was dumb, this man that was demon-filled, the enemy had this man bound he wasn't going forward. He was a public spectacle. He couldn't communicate with anybody. He was bound and at peace until the stronger man showed up and his name was Jesus Christ and he set this man free. Look at this here. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him all his armor wherewith he trusted and divideth his spoils. Uh, so the stronger man comes and he taketh that bitterness and that anger and that condemnation and all those things. I think of what the Bible says, my little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins and not ours only, but also the sins of the whole world. Jesus Christ the strong one, the one that kicked out the, the demons out of the man, Matt Gadara, the one that went ahead and kicked out the devil out of this man that was dumb. Jesus Christ is the stronger man. Verse 23, And he that is not with me is against me. He that gathereth not with me scattereth. He said there's, there's only two sides you can be on. The kingdom of righteousness or the kingdom of darkness. Only There's no neutral ground. Now look at verse 24. I, I love the story here. When an unclean spirit is gone out of a man... He walketh through dry places seeking rest. And finding none, he saith, I will return unto my house whence I came out. Again, on the context, I believe he's talking about the man that was set free. So the unclean spirit, he, he goes out of the man. And now why does he go out? We don't know. Maybe for a temporary reprieve. But, but, he, but he leaves this man here, and he goes out and he's looking for others to go ahead and embody. Look at this. He walketh through dry places seeking rest. He doesn't find any, and he saith, I will return unto what? That's why I believe the person we're discussing in this story here, in verse 24, is not a believer, because the unclean spirit still calls it what? This is my house. You see, once you're born again, I'm the property of Jesus Christ. 
I, I've, been, I've, been, I've been bought by somebody else. He, I've been the word redeemed is to be bought back. I've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. But he says, I'm going back to my house from whence I came. But look at verse 25 here. He says, uh, and when he cometh, he findeth it what? Now, now notice the, the terminology there, it's swept. I believe what he's talking about there is somebody that deals with behavior modification and not spiritual transformation. Somebody that, notice, it's swept. They took a broom and they swept up some of the dust and some of the, but notice it's not washed. It's not washed, it's only swept. And that's what some of us do. We may go to this program and go to this rehab and we may get our act together for a little while and we may try to rearrange some of the chairs and whatever issues that we are struggling with. Temporarily we have found some relief and all of a sudden we are doing better. We have moral reformation. We have behavior modification. We feel everything is better. It's swept, but it's not permanently changed. That's the issue. You know, uh, you know, Aretha, I want to call you out. I heard her testimony tonight, and praise God for her testimony. And uh, th there was one phrase in there that you said that I wrote down. She said, I, 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 I knew how to stop using, but I didn't know how to stay stopped. That was powerful. I, I thought in, in this verse, a lot of us know how to stop. Whatever it is that's troubling us, if it's not alcohol, if it's not drugs, if it's not pornography, if it's not an illicit relationship, we know how to stop. We can morally reform for a period of time. And that's a problem with many. We've, we've, we've morally gotten better in some areas. But if it's not spiritual transformation, if we just have swept our house a little bit. And also, I like that word garnished. Listen to the word garnished in the Greek. It means to put in proper order, to decorate, to adorn, to trim. So I've even put my house in order. Got me a little job, got a bank account. You know, I'm, I'm feeling better, I'm putting some weight on, I've got some dead man's clothes, I'm looking better and everything is going good. <laughs> I, my, my house is it's swept and it's garnished. Think about that, and, and that's the problem. A lot of us know how to stop doing certain things that have gotten us to a trouble, but Aretha, we don't know how to stay stopped. And in your testimony, when you said, I've never tried a faith program before, you see, that's why, and you can read the studies yourself. Look, see the rate of recidivism with secular programs because the problem is the house is still empty. That's the problem. We can learn about endorphins and we can learn about chemical imbalances. We can learn all these scientific terms and we can go to group therapy and talk about our mother and our father, how we were dropped on the head as a kid. And we can talk about all this stuff and then we leave and maybe for a period of time we are swept, we're garnished, everything is in order. But when we get out and all of a sudden, man, you know what, I, I, I think I can try again. I'll control it this time. You know, I got one more run left in me, but this time it'll be different. This time it'll be different. I can control it now. I'm, I'm, I'm different now. I'm, I'm better. I can handle it. I've learned my lessons. And the reason we begin to debate and, and morally come up with all these things is because the house is empty. There's nothing there. And, and look at this here. It says so. It's swept. It's garnished. Uh, amazing here in verse 26. Then he goeth out and taketh to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, that they enter in and dwell there. Why? Because it was his house. It was his house from the beginning. And, and I, want, I want to tell you this for, for again, when the enemy wants to come with his devices and says it'll be different this time, it's never different. I have never met a person talked about testimonies last week. I've never met a person that has said, the best day of my life happened when I first started using crack. <laughs> man, I got a, man, I got a new job. Man, my family is, is happy with me. Man, things have just started happening in my life. Got a new car. Man, uh, I, ever since I started using hair, Ron, boy, things have just, oh, man, my eyes are open. Man, this is great. 
it always gets worse. And, and, and the deception that the enemy has given some people as you chase an experience that you will never have again. Never have again. You're under the illusion if I control it and deal with it. It's gone and the enemy makes you chase it to your ultimate destruction. And for many people, if you think the past was bad, you may have swept up a little while. You may have been garnished for a little bit and put a few things in order. But if Jesus Christ is not sitting on the throne, it's going to be ten times worse the next time. Amen? And all of a sudden, you go back out there and you're swept but not washed. You're reformed but not regenerated. You're, you're modified but yet never changed. And you somehow think, okay, I've, 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 I've dealt with these issues and now I can go ahead and re-engage with some of those things. Listen, it will not get better. I've seen it so many times where somebody comes back, bro, I can't believe what happened to me. I, I, I can't believe it. It's worse than it ever... You know, what I always want to do, listen to me, one thing that the enemy wants to deceive us with is the olden days, how good it was. It wasn't good. You, you, you mentioned suicide. There's, if I took a show of hands, there's many people in this room at some point that thought of suicide. Why? Because the pain was so bad. Let's be real. The pain was so horrific. The only thing that numbed us was the temporary numbing that we got from whatever we were doing or taking. But in the morning, the pain came back and it was worse than ever before. And the only relief that we thought of, I just wish I could end it. And there's people in this room, you have tried. You have tried. So when I think about the past, don't think, oh, oh the good times. They weren't good times. The times of vomit. The times of pain. The times of incarceration. The times of embarrassment. The times of missing my child's birthday. The times of missing their graduation. The times of missing the grandkids. Oh, when the family saw me. The times of not wanting any to be around anybody. It's those times. And however bad it was, he's going to take seven more and it's going to be that much worse than it's ever been before. The answer again is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the strong man. Jesus Christ can come in and take residence because, you know, one of the problems is when we empty and sweep our house and don't replace it with anything, we will end up going back to the only thing that we have known before. You see, I, and I believe this, listen, when you get born again and saved, what changes is your want-tos. It's not that I couldn't do something anymore. When I got saved, I didn't want to. I didn't want to do it anymore. Somebody else was dwelling inside of me. I was the property of somebody else. I didn't all of a sudden want to do things that I knew that were going to destroy me. I wanted to do things that were going to honor my God, and my God can change me. Verse 26, And he goeth out and taketh to him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself, that sounds terrible. And they enter in, and notice when they enter in, there's no opposition. There's no fight. I mean, if you're truly born again, but that's why I don't believe this one, there's no fight. They enter right in. When you can just go right back out and pick up right where you left off with no conscience, with no fight and no battle. You may have swept your house. You may have morally reformed, but you have not spiritually transformed by the Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit living inside your heart. No fight. They enter in and dwell there. They just don't dwell neutrally. No, no. Jesus said, you're either with me or against me. They dwell there, and because the spiritual, these spiritual entities were given a stronghold or a place or a foothold, now what happens in the spiritual world is manifested in the physical world, and it says, and the last state of the man is what? Worse. As we close tonight, you think you got another run left in you? 
It's going to be worse than it ever was before. You think it'll be different this time? It'll be worse than it ever was before. What I want to tell you tonight is don't sweep that house. Don't garnish it. Don't try to put it in order. The stronger man is here and his name is Jesus Christ. He can change you, change your desires, and make you a new man and woman. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed as we close the service. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here tonight and you've never accepted Jesus Christ, I didn't ask if you've joined a program, if you went through so many steps, if you knew all that. Do you know that you're forgiven? So I'm, I'm not sure. I, I would love to know how I can be forgiven. Pastor, would you, would you pray for me? Anybody tonight, raise up your hand. I want to pray for you all throughout the auditorium. I want to be forgiven. Salvation is a free gift. God is offering you real change tonight. Anybody else tonight? I'm going to pray a simple prayer. The prayer doesn't save you, but Jesus does. In the quietness of your own heart, I want you to pray with me something simple. Say, dear God, I know I'm a sinner. I know as a sinner I deserve hell. But tonight I call upon you, the stronger man, Jesus, who died on the cross for my sin. Save me, change me, make me whole. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I, I pray that you listened to those testimonies and you were challenged by the Word of God. And now I want to challenge you once again. And you heard a message about spiritual warfare. There really is a world out there that exists that we do not see. And, and I want to ask you, my friend, are you certain that you know that you are forgiven? That is a probing question, and that really is life's most important question. You see, the Bible says, for as it is appointed unto man once to die, then after this comes the judgment. And it's life's most important question is because it's the one most important reality that we're going to face. I mean, if we know that we are going to die, which we are, and whether it's in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, however long, we are going to die. My question is, where will you spend forever and ever and ever for all eternity? And, and if the Bible says, for as it is appointed unto man who wants to die, then after this comes the judgment. Those are sobering words. The judgment. Judgment of what? You might be watching today and you might be thinking, well, I, I'm, I'm not so bad. What will I be judged? My friend, the Bible talks about the judgment of our sin. If you measured yourself up against God's commandments, how do you fare? You see, the Bible says all have sin. And, and I want you to remember this point. The Bible says, for by the law is the knowledge of sin, Romans chapter 3. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Think about that. A lot of us believe that the law was given that somehow we can justify ourselves by it. We say, well, I've kept five out of the ten commandments. I've kept seven out of ten. And so I, I, if God grades on the, the sliding scale, I'm somehow in. But that's not right. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. The reason God gave us the law was to show us what we were, that we needed saving. So if the Bible says, for as it is appointed unto man, then after this comes the judgment, the judgment of my sin. And if the law tells me I'm a sinner, does that mean everybody's lost? Because if all have sin and the wages of sin is death, but the good news is this, that's why God sent a savior. That's why God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for those sins. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he bore the wrath of the Father so you and I would not have to. He paid a debt so you and I wouldn't have to. He died that death. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. What did Jesus do on the cross? Died, paid the wage. And if you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, your wage is paid. Your debt is paid in full. You are forgiven. So God is not grading on the slanted scale. It's not by keeping most of the commandments. If that was the fact, why would Jesus die? It's the simple fact that Jesus died for your sin. And why don't you this moment, why don't you trust him today as your Savior? And, th and that's what that means when I say, have you trusted Christ as your Savior? And there's many watching, you might say, well, I believe Jesus is the Savior. It's not what I asked. He might be the Savior, 
Is he your savior? Ask yourself that question. Is he your sole savior from sin in eternity? So, well, I'm not sure. Well, why don't you trust him today? Why don't you bow your head? Cry out to God. Just say a simple prayer. Say, dear God, I know I'm a sinner. I know as a sinner I deserve hell, but I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sin. Forgive me, pardon me, in Jesus' name, amen. My friend, if you trusted Christ today, we rejoice with you. Why don't you let us know, write us a letter. If this program is an encouragement to you and we read your letters and when we get them, we rejoice, let us know, drop us a line, tell us what God is doing in your life. But God bless you and thank you for watching. There's one